Good evening, everyone. Welcome here at Pakhuis de Zwijger. Um, it is a very special evening, building stories. Maybe we're also gonna, I don't know, demolish some stories. I'm not sure yet. Anyway, we're gonna talk about film and architecture, and we're gonna screen two wonderful films that have been commissioned by Kaan Architecten in Rotterdam. And I'm here joined by Professor Dickie Scipio, one of the founding partners of uh, Kaan, and Martina Margini, who is the curator of this program and also uh, responsible for communication at Kaan. We're going to be joined by a lot of guests tonight um, here live and also via Zoom. So this is a real hybrid event where we're trying to merge the virtual and the actual or the or the or the physical. Um, there will be a possibility, of course, for you to join in the discussion a little bit later on. Um, we'll be walking around with a microphone. Um, also, while we're having the discussion with our guests, you can. Um, put questions in this Menti platform, which is behind me. Um, it's very easy. I just learned it today, and I'm sure you will be all way more experienced with that. Um, and then enter the code A3549847, and you'll get into the chat box, and you'll, you'll be able to ask your questions. We really want this to be as interactive and open as possible. So. Let's start. Um, also, I think you saw my name behind me, but I'm Dana Linsen. I'm a film critic from the Netherlands, and I'm really happy to, to be talking about architecture and space and, and buildings and, well, everything that actually is very cinematic for me. I mean, even if we're looking around right now, we're, and it's not because of the cameras around us, but we're present in a space, and I think that's a beautiful experience. Dickie, Martina, it's so great to be sitting here with you at our really big kitchen table. Um, let's start and maybe go to back to the origins and the genesis of the of the project. Um, and maybe it's best to start with you, but jump in at any point, Martina. Where where did the the idea of commissioning films about buildings uh, originate? Well, thank you, Dana. Happy to be here. It's wonderful that we are alive again. Okay, the origin of these uh, movies. Um, yeah, well, since long, we uh, are thrilled with the idea of working with films and architecture, because basically, um, both architecture and film, we're working from 2D into 3D and in reverse. And if you think of this a little longer, then we both look uh, to the same position, uh, same point from a very different position. So um, if we can uh, work together, then maybe it will broaden our view. And well, let's say that it's an intellectual dialogue between film and architecture. An intellectual dialogue and also an artistic dialogue. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Speak a bit more about that? Yeah, well, if you look at film, they are composing this whole view with different frames. And the frames doesn't need specifically to be in one place together. Well, architecture is fixed. So we are designing one, let's say, solid piece of architecture. An interesting thing is that a film is able to elaborate, to point out the qualities of the specific frames into one uh, atmosphere that you really truly believe um, it's real. So we can learn about this. And I think in reverse film can maybe also talk a little bit about uh, what parts of the architecture is really special or really interesting also in the longer term. I think we need to talk about that a little bit more, but maybe first, Martina, as the curator of the films, um, maybe you can first talk a little bit about how they all came together, how you selected the artists. Well, definitely. I think it has been a huge gift in general to be, uh, to make this project possible, you know, within the, tr the frame of Khan Architect and, you know, there we're agreeing doing this uh, kind of experiment at the beginning, you know, to try out 
this uh, new form of communication because it was of course uh, part of our communication strategy in a way but uh, we wanted to elaborate something different that go beyond what we usually do uh, in communicating architectural project and i think i was really interesting it i was really interested at the beginning in this shift in between what the architect say about the project and what's the response to a architectural program you know in a competition or a commission uh, seen by the architect and what's the actual life, the real life of a building, you know, and this can be seen by filmmaker, but also from the user, like the user of the buildings of every day. So I think that I wanted to explore this gap that it's in between, you know, what you think a building will be and what you plan it for and how it actually live. And I think that with cinema, we could explore something different uh, and less static than the traditional way we explain architecture, as Dickie says, with 2D <laughs> most of the time. Right now, of course, there are a lot of technique, like uh, beam uh, mapping, you know, 3D models, of course. But I think the cinema, cinema cinematographic eye, since uh, already quite some century, like uh, one and a half century, has really dictated another kind of space and uh, seeing people walking through space really can communicate something different about the project. And uh, I think it, it's not that strange also that uh, an architecture firm could collaborate with a cinematographer or a filmmaker or an artist and then them at their turn they could collaborate with a sound designer or a composer and this creates links that really can really create surprise for us and uh, that's what we were looking for i think so i mean they're not traditional architecture films as we know more documentary style really in servitude of the building um who did you select because there's many filmmakers we're going to see two films and one performance a bit later um but some of them are from the realm of architecture, other are, others aren't. So how did, you, how did the selection process? It was really interesting for us to have diversity, you know, already like uh, starting to open up and not just have a Dutch filmmaker, but also like foreigner filmmaker and not forcefully acquainted with architecture. Uh, which was the point, you know, I really like uh, while visiting the building, you know, for other communication events with people that have nothing to do with architecture because you can really see how they look at the building. But even other architects, of course, can have other point of view on your building or there are filmmakers that train as architects, they decided to do something completely different. Uh, so they work more as artists or filmmakers. So it, my point was to have variety and, uh, of course, uh, like... Uh, different genders were included, you know, like uh, no, there were no, were no presets, you know, like for me it was really like if I feel that somebody has a good feeling, like I have a good feeling and I can match it with the building because we really came to them and proposed them one project, you know, okay, would you like to film here, you know, this is a kind of unique opportunity, we open up the door of this place that normally perhaps is close to the public and we give you this specific format and let's make it live, you know? I want to give emotions to the building. I mean, not me, but as a whole yeah. project, of course. And uh, this, of course, happened in conversation, and we've been really surprised from the idea that arose from this, I think. And, I mean, this also points to something that I think is really important about the project, complete artistic freedom. Mm -hmm. So, on the one hand, you want to, to create something that represents the buildings or opens up these spaces, but people could go all the way. I think this is, a, yeah, it's a bit of, a, we try to explore uh, the niche in a way of commission film, because of course it's a commission. Uh, we give a bit of uh, format to the people also, of course, a budget, uh, length, uh, allocation that can be the subject of the film but also just be in the background we don't really it doesn't really matter and uh, I think that's really like uh, what makes this project special because we really act in conversation and the filmmakers of course can correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> but uh, in conversation once we received the idea then we were discussing and once on site of course sometimes you discover things that you will never think before you know and you're surprised so it was really important for us to be in the space with the filmmakers and explore the building as a whatever person can do you know like uh, either me and you.
yeah, probably we would tell or find other stories, but from the architectural point of view, Dicky, you already said it and, and Martina just confirmed it, the surprises that come out of the project, the, the other ways of actually learning buildings that you've worked and your partners have worked with, um, what did you learn about your own designs or maybe about your partner's designs, if you can say so, that surprised you? Well, actually, many things. The fact is that it's specifically not meant to document the buildings, but to find something and to, let's say, put in the light something that we wouldn't expect. So um, the good thing is that that also happened. So this multi-layering, what filmmakers are good in, um, that came across pretty good. Um, and there are very different uh, films, and also the films that we selected today, they have a very, very different point of view. And um, I think we as architects can learn a lot about that. There, it's not one idea, and we, we like to, to take pieces of the puzzle. Yeah? So we combine uh, uh, whole storyline, and then we like to explain our clients, yeah, well, it went like this and this and this and this. But uh, the reality is completely different. So what people uh, uh, perceive in architecture, how they live it, that is of, imp is of importance. And that is also that sustains for a long time. And I think we have to think about buildings as part of um, uh, uh, our legacy uh, of um, not something that's only there for 10 years, but it's really part of our society. And um, for that, it's, 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 it's it's very interesting to see what the point of view of the filmmakers are, and, and not only the point of view of the architects. In that sense, the filmmakers are like, I don't know, sp very specific users of a building. I can also imagine that as an architect, you design a building, it's finished, and then you rather maybe put it on a, on a glass dome and think, okay, that's very beautiful, but please don't touch it and now you invite people to touch it in the, in the, in the most fantastic and, and, and imaginative ways. Um, was that hard sometimes? Well, actually not. I believe buildings are only really good buildings if they are capable of uh, inviting, embracing every use people can think of, that you like the buildings, you love the buildings, you want to embrace them and keep them and hold them for a very long period of time. And for that, we have to open up for every point of view people have and how beautiful it is if we have, let's say, a profession that is so similar uh, as ours to have their view on the matter. So let's talk a little bit about the three films that were selected for tonight, because there's 10 films, and I'm sure they will be presented in many other ways also um, online. Um, but for tonight, you selected three films, and they're somehow also connected thematically. Yeah, well, we have had this, this horrible time um, hopefully it lays ahead uh, behind us. And so um, I think many, many people have had for the first time in their lives the thoughts about what that really means. So um, how much do we want to pay for life? Literally, but also um, in, in another sense. So how? what's the value of life um, in that sense? Uh, we thought it was a good thing to start with birth. Think about death and think about immortality. So what is the real value of life? What's the fa real value of what we leave behind and what lasts? So these three themes are, are visible and they're, they're in a way transcending um, from, the, from the three films. Um, I'm 
still curious a little bit how sort of going through this process has maybe changed your own practice. Do you think you will design or work on your next building because you also work a lot in heritage and the, the last project is really on a building that you worked on a lot. Do you think it changed you? Will you? Well, my point of view constantly changes and, and grows. Um, and the balance between new and old, this is specifically interesting in these kind of, of, of pieces of architecture, but also in, in a hall. So must we always uh, start anew? Or can we also make a combination of the old and new? Or can we uh, rethink what's already there? Or which quality do we uh, value? And yeah, well, filmmakers, are really good at pointing uh, what is and what's not interesting in specific areas. I'm sure we get to talk about that a bit more when we're gonna go back on stage for our last round when we've seen all the projects and um, it all became becomes a bit more tangible for us. Um, and then hopefully also you as an audience will have some ideas how your uh, perception of buildings has changed over the over the next hour but maybe we'll start now with the first film which is crafted by um camera person director and editor benita vlog who will be joining us uh, via zoom for a talk after the uh, after the screening of her film but let's first watch a film and let's be moved to another space thank let's you do that. <laughs> Buildings don't explain themselves from the outside, you know. Form comes out of the logic of the material. Creating is a very sort of ambitious uh, word for what we do. We just make things, you know. The materials are your manipulations. There's a dimension in architecture that's very important. The dimension of the humanity of materials itself. Uh, they make your building more warm to human uh, feelings. Well, I describe it as the most essential of considerations. humanity of the urban space. Do you feel that something is not is not right? And uh, maybe you need to employ more people, not less people. If we use more dense kind of materials that are natural, that you need more. Uh, craftsmen uh, to think differently, to think better, to think deeper, uh, more intelligent, more rational. One well, should always try to make things that are so much in tune with your day and age that they will resist the passing of time. We fortunately still have this this uh, level of intervention to to manipulate the way society lives, uh, which has to be different from before. But that makes sense. Uh, so there's no time. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, we can do something about it if we intelligent the way we use things as a manipulator of form and space. Creating a tradition of working with people. I think this was already one of the surprises, Dickie, don't you think? You commission a film and then you hear this famous senior architect expressing what you were also maybe already kind of sensing in your head when you talk about time and sustainability and how things change and stay the same. But Nita, welcome. I'm so glad that you can join us um, via Zoom. Um, were right. any of the things that Dickie just spoke about part of your initial ideas when you were thinking, okay, I'm going to make this film and um, how am I going to approach it? Or how did you approach it? Yeah, I mean, I think so out of everybody that made um, films that were commissioned, um, the thing that was unique about how I had to approach uh, this film was that I never had an opportunity to do a site visit before we started filming. Uh, you know, Martina was coming over from Rotterdam and I was flying from Cape Town to Maputo and Mozambique. So we really um, had a big restriction from which to start with um, right from the beginning. So I think my approach to it already was by default going to be different from any of the other filmmakers in trying to kind of think out of the box or working within the limitations. And uh, yeah, sometimes these things are quite interesting when you follow the story. Um, so yeah, I, I was kind of really impressed by that um, process for the architect in the first place in creating a building on the other side of the world and the trust that went into the craftsman um, in making that happen. And that was something that really struck me in the conversations we had before uh, when I was still conceptualizing. And um, yeah, from there, I came up and proposed this idea of, of focusing on those crafts and those, those hands that have created the building and that kind of relationship. And so it became kind of an organic thing um, you know, we planned ahead in getting some access to building sites and things like that. As far as you can, in terms of Africa, everything changes and you have to adapt as you go. Um, yeah, and then in terms of filming the building, it I think also just turned out that out of all of the films, the building in this case is really represented by certain textures and just, you know, uh, kind of parts of the building that to me felt relevant to the to the material that I was showing with the hands uh, and not so much about the building itself. You don't really, uh, you know, if you look at the ratio between shots of the building and shots of, of hands crafting, there's probably more, um, like less of the building. Um, yeah, and that's kind of, uh, you know, just on a visual aspect, uh, the way that I also then decided to um, make those elements merge together was to go in the route of making it black and white. So, you know, texturally, you see everything in the same space. And yeah, so that's just on that, in that sense, visually, that's kind of uh, the approach to it. Yeah. And then when we get to, to the narrative of it was an entire other kind of piece of magic that came together once we were there. So, yeah. So let's talk about, <laughs> about that in a second. I actually love it yeah. that we're we're kind of we're in the building, we're in the making of the building, we're in the, very much in the materiality um, also of, of using traditional crafts. Um, 
but you don't really speak about the, the, the position of the building or the function of the building. It's almost like we're having a little quiz. Where are we? What is the building for those of them, <laughs> us who... Yeah, so, yeah, it's the, it's the Dutch embassy in Maputo. And it was built, I mean, at the time we went, it was built 15 years before that. Um, it's, it's not a space that, you know, everybody has access to um, unless you, you're going there to, I guess, apply for a visa or seeing, seeing the embassy. And it's very interesting, the conversation that's already started happening about, you know, the birth of a, a building, it, it's, it gets created and it's placed somewhere. And then from there, the architect really has to stand back. Um, because life then starts happening in it. And it was the case, a lot of things had changed in this building in the time, you know, since they built it. And then, you know, the kind of shots that really, that I really liked were the ones on the side of the building outside, where you see the, the guys playing football um, and there's graffiti on the side of the building on the outside because that's where the guys are playing football and on the other side there's kids always walking past so you see those shadows so there's an interplay of the life around it as well um, yeah that was so yeah it's in Maputo which is actually a very vibrant very colorful place <laughs> so yeah it was um, it was not an easy decision to to decide to make it black and white for that reason but for this for the concept it was important it's also because the black and white kind of makes us think about maybe older films and that in a way references the idea that you're you're bringing back to life uh, the memory of a building being built it's as if the building is speaking to us like okay this was when i was born i'm going to take you back um in time um you were already earlier saying a little bit that it was already a miracle how the narrative came together. Um, at what point did you realize I need a voice as well uh, to, in a way, speak to these images? Yeah, I, I always wanted to have a voice. It's something that I, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's how I, I often make a lot of my own personal films or things that I have creative freedom and I really like to experiment with narrative in that way. But I initially wanted the, the original foreman that was working on the, the project itself 15 years earlier to have that kind of open interview with him to find the kind of uh, narrative pieces that I, I wanted to, to build my story. Um, however, you know, like I was saying, Africa time and <laughs> I'm, I'm South African, I'm <clears throat> very familiar with what it's like to have to adapt all the time, but it didn't work out. But coincidentally, um, <clears throat> José Forjaz was involved in, the, in the, the project in a small way in that he had uh, developed some, or he made some furniture for the, um, uh, for the embassy. So he was in that way contributed and he's a very, very well-known architect in um, Maputo in Mozambique. He, at the time we were there, he was already 82 years old and, you know, he is very highly regarded. Um, and he helped us initially in our preparation to get access to some building sites and gave us some contacts. And uh, it was Martina really that at some point said to me, but listen, we, you know, this, this other things aren't working out, but we have access to Jose Forjaz. And, you know, my, my only resistance initially was like, would the architect of the building, Vincent, would he be okay with another architect that's so prolific to speak? And he had absolutely no problem with that because um, you know, and it, it made sense in such a broader way. And that's why I say that was a bit of magic and really a, something that came out of the project that was such a gift because I could not have wished to have had a better person speak, you know, someone that has had such a prolific career and that has again and again worked with those specific craftsmen in that country. So for him to be the voice that speaks about crafting and to have had such a big career and be of such an elder 
age that can speak with such wisdom and such uh it it was really just such an incredible experience and gift to to have him and have his blessing on my concept of how to use his words to create my own narrative um you know not necessarily i'm not representing him either in necessarily saying this is a documentary about jose forjas he is contributing uh you know, another color to my palette in, in how to make this conceptual film. And he gave us his blessing, which was really such a gift. So yeah. to wrap our little conversation for now up, because yeah. you're going to jo be joining us later, I have one quick question because I I mean, I'm, I'm seeing these hands again on the screen and I'm thinking you edited the film and of course everything now is digital, but editing before used to be a, a craft in, in the same sense that you were also working with material. Um, can you quickly say something about how the editing process and, and the, the final montage of the film in, in a sense also reflects this idea of many hands working on a building and, and the, the film maybe as a building itself. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that's, um, yeah, it, it's quite beautiful. If you had to ever look at what, uh, you know, just on the software of, of, of editing software, what looks like your timeline and there's these lines, you've got your your footage and your sound and your music and your sound effects. And, and then the people that, um, like my sound designer that comes along and he helps me to re refine things. But in the editing process itself, it really is something that you go by step by step. And it's it's more of an intuitive building than, than having, you know, you have your master plan, I suppose, like an architect would have a building plan, but um, it's you have to change a lot more um, because I'm working also with documentary. You really, really the the whole thing happens in editing that's when you you start figuring it out and um yeah it's i, I love it though but it and it's thanks to this creative freedom we were given um you know which has allowed a lot of time and love and experimentation to go into it yeah editing has been called as you probably will know thinking with your hands and it's just this, this <laughs> kind of beautiful, I don't know, coincidence that's happening here. Thank you, Benita. Um, I think we're going to watch the next film, um, Static. Perfect. And then afterwards, I'll be uh, joined by Red Mike from Spirit of Place. But first, let's go. I mean, it sounds very solemn, but from birth to death. But then, as we all know, there's always life in death. So. Let's dive into the hole and watch Static.
Mike, welcome. And we're not only actually going to be joined by um, one of the filmmakers, but Alice Martins is also here. You jumped right from one screen into another. Um, have you been watching the film on your on your computer screen, Alice? You're the dancer yes. and choreographer um, who's present in the film. Did you just watch it again? Yeah, yeah. I just watched it at the same time as you. <laughs> because I was thinking also about that and about Benita watching the films on your computer screens and, and all our attendees at home. And then we were so lucky because we're surrounded by these three big screens and we really see the, the film and therefore also the building come alive in, in such a different way than on the on the small screen. Um, Alice, I'm going to start with Mike because I think we sort of know where we are at the end of the film, but where are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luckily nobody's there for the reason that they normally would be there in the crematorium. <laughs> but um yeah, I don't I the strange thing about that is like we finished shooting in July of 2019 and you know, nobody could think of how peculiar that was of the concept of, you know, what is this person? What is she doing there? You know, what's going on? And that's basically the static life that we all had to go through for a year and a half or more, depending where we were living. And that it, it's, yeah, that it's just, a, it's for me, it's just great. Out of all the other circumstances, things happen. That's how a film works, where you can go back and you reflect when you watch it at that time. There's stories behind when they filmed it, the constraints, the budget constraints, all these things, the team. But when you look at it, it's just um, it's a nice memory for us because I think that's what everyone had to do in their homes, in their offices. You know, they were exploring space, which is ultimately why we make architecture films to exp you know to appreciate space and to be curious and be in a state of wonder about it. You've had some more experience working with architecture and, and, and film. How was this film different for you? Yeah, um, so basically, yeah, we've, we're a company. I mean, we do commission work for architects all over since 2005, before there was a social media. And I like to tell people, I say, hey, do you know who the first um, social media influencer you know, who were they? That you tell yeah. us. <laughs> no, they, they were architects, you know, the, the Le Corbusier, Walter Gropius, you know, the things, the initiatives that they did 
were because during that time in the 20s when they were building these Kino palaces, they started to use film as a, propag a propaganda mechanism. And so typically the films we're making are f that's purpose. It's an architect talking about the space, you know, like predetermining what well. what they're doing. I mean, sometimes we're sh just showing poetics of the space and it's a corruption of that time because you're lacking the sensory expression that you get from the sound that you're in the space. And we know that. And for us, it's an honor to be a part of 12 other collaborators that are filmmakers that have nothing to do with a commercial thing. And that's good for us because it's like, okay, Martina trusted us that we weren't going to make some shiny commercial selling thing and actually having early on discussions with Vincent that's what our profession needs because when you if you looked at the I think it was 2016 an exhibition at the MoMA for Le Corbusier you saw how he used film as a design tool not only his propaganda things for La Habitación but he was in Brazil and shooting footage out of the train and and that's what I think architecture needs is um, they need to their pre-described thing is only a thought. And the way people inhabit space after they move in, after they take over, after they sell it, and it goes on down the chain, that is out of their control. And they should be more comfortable having that uh, chaos. And that's why we just need companies that don't have us talk to a marketing team and a PR specialist and ask what the return investment on a film is. We just need people that are patrons of art and want people to be investigative. And say, yes, let's do it. When you say, I'm going to work with a dancer. Okay, yeah, no, that, that, that scene after the cigarettes, uh, when Alice was smoking, I, during the location scouting, Martina was walking around on site and there was a photo shoot going on and I just remember seeing her reflection in there and I was just like, oh, actually, could you walk backwards and start from this thing? And I just taking some location scouting pictures and then that's when Martina said, I know this dancer and actually she studied architecture. I'm like, okay, well this, yeah, this film, I need to meet this woman <laughs> because that sounds fascinating. And it worked out and Alice was in Paris and could easily get to Belgium. And then we had another kind of scouting and that's kind of where we, we did like five different treatments of the film. But the concept was is find, let's do some research, let's talk to the normal employees. And that was very important for Vincent. This is a pretty heavy topic. We don't we don't have the budget to like stage yeah. something where you see a ceremony or you know do something where you could imagine eyes wide shut or something and it's just so we had to figure out a plan and that was what it was. Study the everyday experience. Like when she's picking up those little ceramic tiles, that's what they put in the bodies so that when the ashes come there they know that that person was documented, you know, with that stone. So it's like that's the reality. They showed us a tin with all these pieces of titanium, you know, that they clean up. They they told us the calculations. You can heat one home in Belgium for one month with the energy it takes to burn a body of 150 kilograms. And so all these heavy things which are fascinating and, and a kind of a, a heavy reality that we all have to face, it was great to to work with Alice to to have her actually say, hey, I'm a dancer, but I'm really excited about this film that I'm not going to dance. So you know? Alice, what yeah. did you do? And and how much were you kind of directed by those kind of ideas? And also how did you kind of start to own the place as a dancer and a choreographer? Uh, I, I actually took a time of reconnaissance, of exploration, almost as an animal or as a child. And we, we really, took this, this time even before to try to follow the workers. I think um, in collaboration with Mike, uh, we really took the time to, to let the body just really feel the territory to make it mine to um, uh, try to know all the, col all the corners um, uh, to climb where I could to um, feel the details, the lights. And, um, and then we really took the time to follow the steps, the, the path of the workers. 
And it was a way to really recognize the whole building because most of the people that go through this building, they see only one, one uh, room, uh, but there are so many other places, hidden places that the workers uh, go to. And we really had the opportunity to uh, uh, also mimic their gestures to really understand all the actions that they had to go through they, they, with their daily routine. But actually, I was really looking at their non-actions and their uh, kind of also boredom. Like in every work, at some moment, you, you, you can have your moment. And that's exactly the moment I was looking for because I think that's when you, it's the moment when you get bored that you actually really look at what's around you and you actually can start a dialogue and you can project yourself with the building and the materials. And in a way, the workers, they, they're actually uh, having a kind of a do it with the, with the building. And that's what I tried to, to keep, make mine. And then with Mike, to find a, a way to, um, uh, how can I say, to uh, invent uh, a fictional worker uh, that start this uh, gentle, uh, embracement of the of the building so for me it's really a way to see the building also as a body as a something that you you try to embrace in whole ways and to play with the limits and to be contained and so that's uh, that was something really powerful uh, in this building because we, we knew the, the, the reality and people were actually grieving. Um, but going with the workers was a way to, uh, to actually being part of a, a real life of the building. What's that? I mean, was that for you this, working in the same way that the, the body be, or the, the building became a, a body through actually presence in space? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even for us, like we we came out with some ex some kind of inexpensive like Bluetooth microphones that we could attach to her body and around the space. And so some of the stuff, even when you come back into the editing, th then you could feel that sequence of different parts of the space or walking on a air vent or something and how this echoes through but yeah th that that was the, the thing like um yeah for us when we got to the editing we made a storyboard and we showed some of these ex examples but for us there's indefinite amounts of with of it, with any film once you get on there and choose how the things work together for montage that was all these little M like middles, you know, people are born, they die, they spend a long time, hopefully not taking for granted their middle. And this building is like a reminder of mortality because every building that's worth something will be standing there for longer than anyone can live in them. And so to be in that state of wonder and to embrace those like little middles and have fun, that, that was just enjoyable to watch Alice be in the camera. There wasn't like, oh, could you put your arm up a little bit higher? There was, there was just like pure trust, and and we explored it together through watching her almost reduce her movements. You know, like I mean, right here where she does, you know, just kind of warming up and moving her body. It was still just you could see she was reacting to seeing herself in a in a mirror, and nothing was like planned, and it felt really natural and good. That goes for the performative element of it. On the other hand, what is very striking, of course, is the, the visual concept um, of the film where 
um, the, the, the glass can work as a mirror and as a portal to some other kind of reality and everything from the hallways um, to the, these little, little frames in frames, they create a lot of spatial elements as well. And that's something that you probably do need to prepare in terms of where do you put the camera and how do you organize the framing. Yeah, I mean, some of that was just watching the, the the workers, like the actual when they when they put the body to have the service there. You know that this is the, a very very unique thing because in Belgium, just like here in the Netherlands, there's not a lot of space <laughs> like America, where you you know the, you, so actually I think the director told us that from the last 70 or in the last 30 years, they changed from 30% to 70% people being cremated. And in Belgium is one of the only places where you can, in 90 minutes, you have a service, the body's there, they cremated, you could have the ashes that day, you know, like a drive through. You know, in <laughs> a way it's very practical, but if you say like this, it's also so sinister. No, it's yeah, no, but, but it's, but it's, it's th we have to look at it. If we look at the world, there's 117, if we look at Homo sapiens being back to 500,000 BC, there's 117 billion people that are dead, and only less than 10% of that are living right now. You know, and even if it increases by 4 billion, there will be 120 billion. So that is something that we are faced with, and, and we, it's, for me, I really thought, I went through my mom's death, who was cremated during this, the filming of this thing, spending long nights in there alone or even during the construction phase you really got to reflect on the the you know death and and it was it's a beautiful thing to be in a space that's so moving you know yeah and that that you actually managed to to make move through through the film and also this kind of dynamics between <laughs> presence and absence, which I think are architectural principles as much as, as filmic principles. Um, we'll be back later on talking a bit more, Alice and Mike, but I think now is the moment where I'm going to invite Jaime Levinas to the stage, who's going to do something, um, I don't know if we're going to call it, let's call it interfilmic. It will be uh, a performative action with some of the footage um, from the film he shot, and we're gonna let's experience it and then talk about it later. Not on an immortal being. <coughs> Note one, words by Nadia de Vries, part one. Ik ben een kompas. Ik heb het noorden in me zitten. Ik heb de nek van een zwaluw tussen mijn tanden gehad. Ik heb de brontaal gerecycled tot een dialect. Klei zien veranderen in aarde. Daar waar anderen slechts schattingen hebben, heb ik herinneringen. Ik dans ermee. Ik ben verzadigd. Mijn lichaam in het landschap verankerd. Geen brandstapel heeft mij klein gekregen. Mijn voorouders zijn olie op doek. Note number two, documenting the undead. At the end of the 19th century, the Russian philosopher Nikolai Fedorov developed the project of the common cause which called upon the modern state to resurrect and make immortal through science all individuals who have ever lived upon the earth. Fedorov used the art museum as a model for the utopian society of immortals he wanted to build. Not much after Fedorov's ideas, the first films were made. Cinema, among many other things, is a document of the dead most people that were captured through the lens are no longer living, yet they are immortalized in pellicule. The relation between cinema and immortality and time are fundamental. Mm -hmm. 
Note number three, Boris Groys excerpts on immortal corpses. In our culture, the actual locations of physical immortality are our various archives, and in particular, the museums. Work of art are the corpses of objects. In art museums, objects are kept and put on display. The life of artworks in museums is a life after death, a vampiric life protected from the sunlight. Note number four, architectural function. The Royal Museum of Fine Arts in Antwerp could be seen as a coffin or a cemetery or an archive or any structure meant to guard the immortal being. Its concepts are experienced by walking through them. And I would say that this experience is a metaphysical one more than a real one. And so one has to understand that a space is not seen but experienced and experiencing comes from juxtaposition more than from orientation. It is ambulatory. In the sequence of the vampire running around the museum, there is no geographical obligation towards the architectural structure. There is an emotional and metaphysical obligation towards its fundament. The room after room in an endless circle has no material boundaries, which, of course, the real museum does have. In this regard, the museum, like many other architectural structures, does not materially exist. They are mere communicators of an idea that is limited by its materiality. The walk of the vampire through this virtual space becomes the eternal story of these corridors, of the thousands of people that have walked through them, and the thousands of people that will do so in the future. The endless reenactment of the walk through the museum in the search of the self. Note number five, words by Nadia de Vries, part two. The tight, my intime seminar, my main, my main is Pultura gevriend. Hij heeft me aan het werk gezet. Hij heeft me aan het werk gezet en me zo binnen vleisterafstand van het leven gehouden. In deze gangen heb ik fonetisch leren denken. De angst om te verliezen is nooit de mijne geweest. Ik sla motten uit de lucht. As op uit papier. Met of zonder jou. Mijn was trapt op de grond. Mijn tombe kan niet dicht. Postscriptum, on the human side, thank you Dicky, builder of immortal structures. Thank you Tina Maharatze, articulator of Cosmos values. 
Thank you, Khan, Martina, Sara, Ruben, Rosie, Inga, Nadia, and all others that are making this film come to light or stay in darkness. Thank you. Well, Jaime, thank you. I think this is this is maybe going to be the future life film and architecture. I love it because this really needs to take place in a space. Actually, I can't wait till you do something in the Museum of Fine Arts in Antwerp. Um, for our viewers at home, I'm just going to repeat the uh, the Menti code in case you are thinking of the many questions that we can ask if we had time to talk till midnight. And the code is eight three five four nine eight four seven. Um, if you want to join in with uh, with questions a little bit later, with Jaime, just let's start with you. There's so many questions. Um, and the, the most obvious one would be how did you came up with this kind of triple idea of the museum and the, and, the, and actually the start of the museum uh, tradition sort of coinciding with the birth or one of the births of cinema and uh, the emergence of the vampiric figure um, in, in, in literature. Um, how did that pop wow. in your head? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and um, then the <laughs> lecture will be over in 90 minutes. Yeah, no, I think uh, to go back to your, um, maybe for the people also at home, uh, it, this is just uh, me showing some of the footage of, of the film that is coming out in a few months. And indeed, I think the film will end up being uh, partly a film that you can just watch in cinema and uh, another part would be indeed like something more uh, of a live performance um, that will be, as you can see, it also works as a silent film, but I would like the actual um, actress to, to Tina Maharadze to uh, give, to make a voiceover live and, um, and the music that is specially uh, composed for this film uh, to be also played live just like uh, in silent times, uh, which were not so silent, actually. And um, yeah, and to answer your question, I think um, I started, uh, this is the Museum of Fine Arts in Antwerp, and um, basically I went into history and started uh, figuring out all these uh, interesting parallels uh, between the, this building was built in the 19th century, and I wanted to position a bit uh, myself uh, historically what was happening um, and and the type of things that were happening inside the museum but also outside of it and very soon um, well actually from the get-go I knew that I wouldn't uh, want to make a, an architecture film uh, in the in the strict sense of the word so I basically started thinking uh, first reading about it and 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 thinking in ways uh, what architecture film also can be. And I came out with the idea, I came up with the idea that actually um, when you walk through the building, when you read about the building, you start seeing its function and and all types of metaphors uh, come to mind. And one of them is, is this idea that uh, the, the structure in and of itself is a structure that is meant to keep the artworks uh, through eternity, uh, to immortalize um, artworks. So in the sense that if you go and you watch, uh, you go to see a Rubens uh, painting at this museum in 1950s or in 2000 or in 2023 or 2022 when it will open, um, the painting should be the same, the exact same. And this idea of um, keeping or creating a, a place that is made for through eternity um, inspired me to to really think about what uh, the what the connection with film and immortality is and that and and very soon uh, you can figure out that a vampire is basically a very a very interesting metaphor for that uh, it's also you know sensitive to light and it can die but it can also stay forever if you conserve it drink blood and stuff but um so yeah i that that's basically the three pillars of it uh i don't know if that answers 
slightly That's the question. That's the beginning of an answer <laughs> of, a, of a conversation that we're Oh, yeah, and about the literature yeah. uh, element. Yeah, so, of course, when the building started to exist, and actually the museums in, in, in general, uh, like, it, w it so happened that also the, the narrative of the vampire, as we know it, uh, started to exist. So... Um, uh, it it ended up it culminated of course with Dracula but uh, there was a short story uh, called Vampire um, and that's the you know vampires have existed for much longer than that but the you know this cultured being um, this um, aristocratic uh, idea of the vampire has existed for around the same time as museums and. For me, I think it's it has something to do with this notion of um, thinking what do people do when they have all the time in the world, when time is not limited. And that's uh, partly what also in this uh, little thing that I just said, um, I was talking about, about ideas that um, probably art and literature um, and culture are the things that will drive this being that has unlimited time, because those things are as immortal as the being itself. Um, and then I came up with the idea that during the construction that has been now taking place for around 20 years of this building, um, a vampire was living there. It's a little bit like I'm suddenly thinking of Jim Jarmusch's Only Lovers Left Alive. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Where actually, this is also part of the of the narrative structure um, that art, maybe in the end, is also the only thing that saves us because I think it's a beautiful film, and that's in a way it's it's a kindred spirit to your um, film. Um, before I'm going to invite everybody else back on stage and see if we can have a very festive last round where we're also going to be talking more about your film is the collaboration um, with Nadia de Vries, the, the poet, because you um, read some of her texts as well. Um, how did that come about? And um, well, actually, the whole project is is I I think uh, short films I um, are always in a way an attempt to. Uh, answer the question of what a short film can be and in this specific case I was very intrigued by the concept of uh, commissions uh, but not actually very much in the contemporary sense but also in the historical sense because uh, Ruben, Rubens was uh, very much uh, you know his life and, and, and many actually artists have been uh, dealing with this uh, concept and um, in a way I was very interested in in thinking of the film as a coming together of artists from different fields. And actually Nadia was one of the latest people to come on board. Uh, at first we, we shot the film and collaborated obviously with uh, Robin Hameling, which is uh, the DP of the film, and with Dina Maharaza, which is the actress. And then soon after I worked with uh, my composer uh, slash uh, sound designer friend that uh, built the sound. Of course, now you couldn't hear the sound because there wasn't any, but in the real film, there, there, is, will, there be will be sound. Yeah, and, and that was we're made. Yeah. going to talk about the sound when we've invited everybody <laughs> else back right, on stage. Right, right. So I'll no, keep that. Yeah. No, yeah. So yeah. you continue, and can Dicky and Martina and Mike sort of slowly crawl up this stage like immortal beings and join <laughs> us? But please continue yeah, yeah. about this no, so collaborative idea. Yeah, so basically then uh, Noah started crafting this, uh, the, this, the sound of the film. And then, um, and then I uh, put it back into the film. So, and, and then I knew what, I, what the words, uh, what it should do. But I thought um, I wanted another artist as well to embody um, the actual voice. Um, not the actual voice because it's performed by the, by the actress, but uh, the words, the poem. So um, that's basically how it came to be. And I found Nadia Friesen and she wrote an amazing poem, which I couldn't uh, put in in its entirety, but again, um, kind of giving the chance to, to create a poem and then extract some parts. And then as the last part of the, the this collaboration of artists, we are also working with uh, Gianmarco Falcone that has a small role in the film. Uh, and he's a painter 
up and coming painter and he's uh, painting um, a portrait of this vampire. So we have all these different disciplines, architecture, literature, um, image, sound, uh, painting. Which in a way is a construction or a reconstruction and a deconstruction at the same time of film as the seventh art because you really tried to bring all these art forms that somehow um, can be combined to something cinematic together. How intentional was that? Yeah, I took it a bit too literal. Sometimes I catch myself in finding that I took it literally very literal. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but it's an interesting experience, I think, yeah. And since you're at the table with such a cinephile, um, <laughs> how many vampire films did you did you watch in, in the development of your visual style? Um, actually, I don't know if I watched so many uh, vampire films, but I did watch a lot of um, films that are very much set in in a non-real, like in very you know gimmicky. Uh, you know, B movie ish or or like uh, very fake sets, um, and and I think that had something to, and old films, a lot of old films. So I wasn't very interested during the pandemic. This was shot a few months ago, so it was very much during the pandemic. And in the pandemic, I wasn't very interested actually in um, in new films. I was more interested in 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 things that would bring me to somewhere else or. Uh, another place and I think this is also in a way the answer to to consuming all these different worlds and and this need of sometimes uh, like a fakey like something gimmicky an artifice that you create that the filmmaker creates um, yeah so now I would really like to ask you and Mike but also Benita about the sound which we've been sort of keeping out of the discussion because I think this is something that plays a different role in all three of your your films um, and of course I mean once again let's experience the space where we are together and also the people at home the, every person who's speaking or everything that's I'm just gonna do this happens creates something in, in, in a space and it becomes the body of an instrument. So I find it fascinating how all three of you worked with your with your sound. You can have a little bit of water. Maybe Benita, we can start with you. How did you work on the development of this sound? And then also once again, after that, we're gonna open it up for questions from the audience and people at home take your chance to go to the Menti platform. But Benita, tell me about the sound, please. Yeah, sure. Um, it's it's always such a privilege for me to have this kind of opportunity to sit some with someone that is creatively just so open working with sound. So uh, this collaborator of mine, Mornay, we've worked on several projects before together. So we really get each other's aesthetic. And with this one, um, like I intentionally said to him that when we are creating the sound effects over those movements and those things that we don't make it um you know we're not trying to match the real sound we're not trying to make it uh you know a documentary sound we're interpreting the sound um in a new way so i guess it was it was just it it, it lended to another creative avenue to to not make it pure documentary but to to just give it an entirely different texture that will draw attention in more. Because if something is, uh, you know, uh, what you expect, it could possibly lose you somehow. But if you're you're creating something, <clears throat> even if it's very subtle in the way that it's something different, um, it just makes it more interesting. So it's a really incredible dynamic like, space in which to play. And I was very fortunate to be working with him and bring that all that alive all this intricate sounds and pausing when we need to pause and yeah he's great so yeah i have to so give that to him in that sense yeah. your whole film became an acoustic space or the, the body <coughs> of an instrument yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah mike you were already mentioning a little bit before how you work with little microphones and and all that so how yeah. did 
So, or when I came to Rotterdam, there was a, a famous, actually I met a girl at the airport, she was on the flight, and she was meeting this guy, Dennis Vosure, I don't know how to say it, the Dutch name, but he's a pretty big guy, like in the scene there in Rotterdam, and he has all these analog synthesizers, and this girl was coming there to rent out studio space, and I met with him, I told him about this project, and he was excited and said, hey, I can, I can make, we can make field recordings of the ovens, and we can bring that into this, these synthesizers. And so like that didn't make it into the budget. And I wanted him to actually bring a lot of his equipment there. I was there. just thinking, when did we so, exactly so, so that, so that, But that's, that's where we started with. And actually, we, um, a friend of mine that I became friends with when we started our company in Milan in 2004, we, he went back and worked on the West Coast as an architect. And I was working with rights, you know, like getting permissions and licensing for our films. and he started making music and was learning piano and learning the drums and then he moved to Berlin and we slowly gave him this like record contract and we freed him up from some of the depressing situation he was at as a normal architect working in a firm that he wasn't really satisfied with. So we kind of, for us we say, you know, let Oh, do never go to royalty-free music sites. You know, like the time you spent on that to find something good is, you just need to be a patron in whatever sense you can, get someone to make something custom for it because if you're just, unless it's a silent film and you can get someone to play music like Chile Gonzalez making, you know, he started out as a silent um, piano player in Montreal and I think if you can make these events, and I like what Hame is doing to, to make events because that is what film was, like people getting together, going to the theater, going to see films, and watching it on a screen that's like bigger than their peripheral vision. But the reality is, is we're making these films to be shared you know, on your phone screen. And so anytime you have the chance to, to do that, uh, that's what we have to do. do. It. Yay, yeah. for, yay for cinema. <laughs> um, but Jaime, I mean, you sort of used the traditions of, of silent film, but I think you took the biggest step in really thinking about sound and actually also using the spaces as uh, acoustic bodies. Or um, Yeah, well, on both, yes, I guess, because... Um, what I we actually shot the whole film without uh, a, there was no sound recordist, uh, so all the sound uh, is being done in post production, and in the sense that uh, both every time that you know uh, she walks or um, or the actual spaces that are created, but of course because it's a vampire film. And 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 the the specific approach to the film is not to in any way to be uh, uh, it's very not real uh, it's not realism so therefore that gives all types of possibilities and I think um, uh, specifically in sound the idea that you can hear something um, when you need to hear it just like in dreams uh, you don't have to uh, have the constant awareness that just because somebody's walking that you will hear their footsteps. But sometimes you might, might maybe you only hear footsteps. So this idea that, um, that the whole sound post-production can be done uh, very meticulous and, and really think about what, uh, when you want to hear music, when you want to hear a specific sound and that you also have to craft it. Um, and the craft that goes into it uh, was for me very, exciting to to work with with my um composer and and sound uh, designer yeah and the beauty of sound is i th i think those of you who actually go to the cinema every now and then um will experience it it adds narrative layers to a film in a in a very kind of subconscious uh, manner because you kind of experience it in a sensory uh way before you actually understand what you're hearing like before you're falling asleep actually your eyes close first and your ears are still um, working so quick question for the three of you and then I'm really go gonna look at the audience like are there any questions but did this idea of enhancing the, the narrative through sound did that come in an early stage or in the post-production I'm just yeah. looking at you. Yeah, um, 
in that time, there's a, a podcast that's called The Sound of Sports, and it was redone on 99% Invisible, and that is proof of when the Olympics started being filmed or they started filming tennis, you know, they had to make sounds, and watching sports without sounds is would be the most boring thing ever. People would not watch it. That's what they did during the pandemic with football games. They actually made soundtracks for football games yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Or I mean, it's a big thing. Or just to make for for game. Yeah, for gaming and doing that. And for us, yeah. I mean, hearing the sound of a titanium hip being collected with all these people and just hearing that and that that was like bone. Ch or it just was chilling. And the sound of the ovens and that was that. It's it's very important that space when you walk in that huge out of the atrium. I mean, it's. It's just so monolithic, and the sound plays such a, a role in the visuals, you know. So seeing Alice walk there and doing field recordings, I mean, typically when, when the budget's there, we have Ryan come do field recordings of spaces. But watching that sound of sports, they talked about the gymnasts on the vault, and they put contact microphones in the vault so you can really feel when they're doing those tricks and like I would love to have budgets where we can put contact microphones in the architecture to, to amplify what those experiences are. So I see something coming up in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be a wonderful next thing. Benita, and in, for you in terms of the narrative, because you also yeah. work with voice, of course. So how do you balance yeah. that? Yeah, I you know, the consideration of sound for me in anything I do is is very high on the priority list because it's it can it can really I think make or break your film if you're not paying enough attention to it. So I I try and work with the best people that I can work with. Um, but so on the actual shoot while we were in Maputo, the only audio recording I actually had was uh, the interview with Jose Fourjas, which was uh, just on a Zoom recorder and a lapel mic um, that we sat over a table and interviewed him. And for the rest of it, I on my camera, I even switched the sound recording off because I knew that once we get back to Cape Town and once we start crafting it, that it will be very much something that we're going to build from scratch. Um, and, but yeah, I think, you know, having lived the, the actual sound while you're shooting it, you really are already imagining kind of the type of texture or the, the kind of rhythm you can have through things. Um, yeah, so it's definitely a, a very big consideration going into anything for me personally also to just, yeah always so, put that in the forefront of my mind when I'm seeing things and when I'm filming things. You not only made us experience spaces better or see them better, but also hear them better. Are there questions from the audience at this point? I think we covered a lot of stuff, and um, but maybe you have ideas or questions that came up that you feel we need to talk about a bit. Otherwise, Dickie, I'm going to go to you for a second because... Jaime worked in a building that you were working on um, in, in terms of reconstruction. Um, so seeing seeing this work, this filmic work, is it complementary in a in a way to your work on the building? Well, we spoke a lot about it, and it's a lot about um, this knowledge, uh, sharing of knowledge, but also this accumulating of knowledge and uh, creating the awareness about nothing, nothing you can take for granted. And I think all the movie makers, well, they, they got really deep into that. We are now aware of each and every step that was needed to express what they wanted to express. And that can be very different than we architects uh, meant with the building. And uh, Jaime and me, we spoke a lot about um, this building and this, this, all this art that's laying there for, for years and years and years. But it is perceived by every person as a new 
piece of art. And we can't even know, although the piece of art is exactly the same, we can't even know whether the persons uh, understand and accept the same thing. Um, so you get conceptually completely different perception of the environment, of the buildings, of movie making, but also about constructing things, making things. And it would be so good that if we came to understand more how things are made, what we gain with it, and, and if we have this connection between music, art, uh, performances, film, architecture, um, yeah, then we are back by really experiencing a life and, 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 and what time means really means for us human beings. In that sense, the, the three films not only reflect birth, death, immortality, but actually also craft, functionality, and I don't know, transcendence. <laughs> so there's, there's many things going on. Are there any pressing questions from the audience? Otherwise, of course, you can always join us a little bit later when we go um, off offline uh, because in a minute or so we're going to say goodbye to our online audience so martina maybe my last question would be for you what's going to happen with all these films where can we see the rest and how can they tell their friends and family and neighbors that well, they had this amazing experience well i think the goal with the project was also to raise a conversation about this topic that we are talking about also this evening and not just uh, describe a building as it is. So the film were commissioned also on the purpose, as we were talking about before, of discovering these inner, la like, um, hidden layers, let's say, of storytelling that somebody can bring up, you know, and we can discuss about it and we can discover something different through film or other practices that interconnect or and the filmmakers decided to collaborate with. Uh, so I think for the future, of course, is a project that can go on forever, you know. For the moment, we are at 12 <laughs> films, of course. <laughs> I hear infinite. so many exciting projects that can architect <laughs> can do in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just have to find some sponsors. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's anyway an amazing project. And I think the, the 12 films uh, interconnect in different ways. Like this evening, we found this sort of fil rouge that connect the three films as you said, like birth, death, and immortality to resume, you know, because of course there are so many other feel rouge like the sound, but there could be any other storytelling that can raise from this, you know, apart from raising a discussion about how the building is, and that's evident to everybody, you know, uh, these uh, other conceptual um, ideas that come from it, you know, and from which us architect or the architect possibly can learn something from, and, uh, and in engage a conversation with other practices. So I think w from our side, we can say that we learn a lot about, you know, collaborating with practices that perhaps are not so much, you know, involved in the normal process of building a building, you know, but uh, they are so useful to understand a building life before, after, and when the building is delivered, you know, the sound, the presence of a body in space, how it moves around, you know. Um, the colors, <laughs> it's something that it's, and the movement, of course. I'm pretty sure that after this experience and all these ideas that we just heard, at least for a few days, we will all experience space and sound and vision in a different way. So um, in that sense, it's already mission accomplished. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, our guests on Zoom, Benita Flock and Alice Martins. Thank you so much for being with us and hopefully we'll see each other in real life uh, very soon. Then I would like to thank Pakhuis de Zwijger and Kaan Architecture for organizing um, this hybrid event. But most of all, the people here at the table um, that we can talk with for another week, we could organize a seminar about this, <laughs> right? Yes, well. Storytelling <laughs> and the differences between film and architecture. I'd love that. Anyway, um, Jaime, Mike, Martina, and most of all, Dicky, thank you so, so much for being here, but also for making this possible. And thank you for uh, watching and listening and even only osmotically, telepathically sharing your <laughs> thoughts with us. Thank you so much. <laughs>